it is a, a heresy to deny Christ's deity, because that's an essential doctrine. But what's lesser known is it's a heresy to deny Christ's humanity. In other words, a heresy is denying some major doctrine of the Christian faith. And these are all major doctrines. So anyone who denies any one of them would qualify as a heretic, a cult, in a theological sense. Why is it that if you deny Christ's humanity, it's a serious uh, thing? Well, we'll get the answer to that in five points. And we'll look at the biblical basis for it, the creedal statements, the doctrinal importance, some unorthodox views, and some objections that are uh, given to it. Number one, the biblical basis for Christ's humanity. He had a human mother. He had a human conception. He had a human prenatal life. He had a human childhood. Jesus had a human adulthood. He had human relatives. He had human friends. He had human emotions. And he had a human death. Everything about Jesus was 100% human, not 99, not 95, 100% human. Let's take a look at these one by one. He had a human mother. His mother's name was Mary. She was a human being with a human ancestry, which is given in Luke 3. Uh, she had a human cousin named Elizabeth. You remember she went to visit. Uh, when she became pregnant, she was six months behind Elizabeth, who gave birth to John the Baptist. Mary went through a nine-month human pregnancy. It wasn't like, bango, the baby's all ready to go uh, there. She went through a nine-month uh, human pregnancy. Uh, and the Bible says she was great with child. Remember King James uh, when they were there at the end? She had a human delivery. In fact, the Bible says she brought forth her son. Probably sat on a birth stool as they did, and she actually gave birth to her own uh, baby. She brought forth her firstborn child. She had a normal human anxieties. Remember when they were on their way home from the feast in Jerusalem when Jesus was 12 and they looked around at a big company of, of people and he wasn't there and she, what happened to our son? And they went back and she said to him, we were anxious about uh, you. She was a normal uh, human person. She had other human children, Mark 6, 3. We'll read the list in a moment, brothers and sisters mentioned. She attended uh, human social events like a wedding and religious festivals uh, like uh, circumcision, uh, eight days, 40 days uh, for dedication. She also had a human conception. Now, we know that it was superhuman in the sense that uh, it didn't have a male sperm involved, but uh, once Mary uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, once the Holy Spirit fertilized uh, one of her uh, ova, uh, the conceptus implanted himself in her uterus in a normal human way. There was nothing unusual about it except how it got started. It got started by the Holy Spirit doing what can't normally happen, and that is uh, a woman's uh, uh, ovum apart from a male sperm having a child. But once that happened, everything from that point on was human. Jesus began as a conceptus. Uh, he grew into an embryo. He went through all human development as a normal human fetus undergoes. His heart muscle began pulsating 21 days after conception. He got a brain wave 42 days after conception. By the third month, he could feel organic pain and even suck his thumb. A couple months later, he was dreaming and swimming in his mother's womb just like other babies do. Uh, sometimes we, f we paint such a superhuman picture of Jesus that... Uh, we forget that he was human, just 100% human on every single level. He had a human childhood. He was circumcised, as every Jewish boy was, on the eighth day. Uh, he grew physically. The Bible says he grew in stature physically. He also grew uh, in understanding. That means he didn't know everything from the time he was conceived. He didn't know everything from the time he was born. Uh, he learned the mathematical tables. He memorized scripture as any other child would do. He grew in understanding. He obeyed his parents. Remember when the parents came back and said, where were you? We thought you were with the group. And he said, uh, I was supposed to be about my father's uh, business. But he says he submitted himself to his parents and went with them. Note, the stories of uh, the childhood miracles of Jesus 
are apocryphal. There are stories about he's working his dad's carpenter shop and he saw us off a board too, too short, and so he just stretches it out. Uh, you know, there are miracles about his plane. He's making little clay pigeons and he touched them and they became alive and flew away. There's some apocryphal stories about uh, Jesus uh, being che uh, jeered by the neighborhood kids and he smote them with blindness. Uh, or his teacher giving him a hard time, so he zapped his teacher and he withered up. Uh, all of these are apocryphal. They all come from the second and third century. See, in the apocryphal books, they have no basis for them uh, whatsoever. In fact, we know that they're wrong for two simple reasons. One, they had miracles during his childhood, and the Bible says his first miracle was when he was an adult. This is the first miracle, turning water into wine, Cain of Galilee. Two, these books claim to be written by apostles and associates of the apostles who had been dead for 100 years or 150 years. Their second and third century books saying, I, the apostle Thomas, write to you. Well, it couldn't have been the apostle Thomas because he's dead and gone. So those two reasons alone, plus the fact that they're filled with heresies and false teachings and uh, apocryphal stories. He had a human adulthood. Jesus got hungry. You say, well, he's God. Yeah, but he's also man. He's also a human being. Uh, he got hungry, Matthew 4. Now, you'd be hungry, too, if you hadn't eaten for 40 days or 40 nights. This is the temptation. See, he got hungry. He got thirsty. He got thirsty. He was uh, tired. They stopped by the woman of Samaria, you remember, by the well, and he, he was thirsty. He wanted to drink. On the cross, he said, I thirst. Jesus got physically tired. They were weary from their journey. Uh, so he got physically tired. He didn't have superhuman strength that he could just walk day and night, never sleep, and all of that. He was not a superman. He was a man. Uh, he was God, but he was still a human being. He went to social events. Jesus uh, was even criticized for this. Remember, John the Baptist was kind of a, an ascetic. You know, he ate uh, grasshoppers uh, dipped in honey, uh, locusts, same thing, grasshoppers. Uh, and wore a camel skin garment. He's out in the desert. He was kind of a recluse, you know, kind of a prophet type. Of. Jesus was going from party to party. He went to the Pharisee's house to a party, and he was called a wine bibber, you know, got bib, uh, wine on his uh, bib. He was, he was a socialite. Uh, he was tempted by the devil to sin. Have you ever been tempted to sin? No, none of us are ever tempted to sin. Uh, he was. He was so human that when the devil came to him, the devil tempted him three times to get him to fall. And he felt the force of sin pulling on his life from the outside in, not from the inside out because he had no lust, he had no fallen nature. He felt the force of it, and it was real. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet apart from sin, Hebrews 4.15. He got weary of the crowd. He got tired. Now, I don't know how many times... Uh, uh, you've gotten weary of crowds, but uh, Jesus did. He was always thronged with people. There were thousands and 5,000 and 4,000, and he was thronged with people. He had to go out in a boat uh, to do one of his sermons because there were so many people there. He had to get out in the land. Then Mark 6:31. It's a verse that all of us should take to heart, and I'm preaching to myself. Jesus said, roughly paraphrased from the Greek, come apart or you'll come apart kind of uh, Muffet's translation or the reverse version, but uh, come apart and rest a while for there were many coming and going and they had no leisure so much as to eat. So he had to constantly retreat uh, and come apart from the crowds because he got weary of it. He cried over a friend's death. There's nothing so touching as the story of Lazarus. He cried over a friend's death. Is it right to cry? Well, it almost certainly is. If you don't cry, there's something wrong. If you don't cry, Jesus cried over a friend's death. In fact, he had human relatives. Is not this the carpenter? Now notice, this is the only place in the Bible that says Jesus was a carpenter. Elsewhere it says he was the son of a carpenter. But he picked up the trade himself. His father died probably by the time he was a teenager. Uh, his father had died. He took over the family uh, business. Uh, he was a carpenter, the son of Mary, indicating Joseph wasn't around. He had a brother named James, one named Josie, Judah, and Simon. And he had sisters that the Bible doesn't name for us. 
uh, are not his sisters all here with us. Now, Roman Catholics believe that Mary was always virgin, never had any more children. Pretty hard to reconcile with this verse, saying he's got brothers, names them, he's got sisters, got a mother and father. The word brother usually means, or sister, a direct sibling. It can mean a, a cousin uh, on uh, remote occasions, but in the context here, they were probably his brothers and sisters. Uh, in other words, uh, Mary's children after Jesus was born. He was just the firstborn, and she had other children after that. At one point, his own people, his relatives, now if you were writing the Bible, and you were trying to make Jesus look like a big guy and deify him, would you tell this story? This is one of the signs of authenticity of the Bible. At one point, his own people went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he's out of his mind. This guy's out of, out of his tree. Now, did you have a brother who claimed to be Jesus? See, if you had a brother who claimed to be Jesus, what would you think, you know, if he claimed to be uh, God? So some of his relatives, his own uh, half-brothers, didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. After his resurrection, he was seen by James, one of his half-brothers, who was converted and later became one of the pillars of the church, Galatians 2.9, and wrote an epistle, and one of his other brothers... Uh, Jude, as it's uh, uh, spelled uh, here, uh, was also a writer of a book. He wrote the book of Jude. So two of Jesus' half-brothers wrote books in the New Testament, James and Jude. He had human friends. Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. He used to go over to their house to retreat. Remember Martha? Martha, thou art busy about many things. She was always serving him, and Mary was sitting at his feet learning from him. Uh, he stayed there many times. His special friendship is expressed in Mary's words, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. She knew if she said to Jesus, he's sick, that he would come immediately. He didn't. What did he do? He waited till he died and then came. Is any less loving? Not at all. Uh, Jesus wept when he stood by his friends. He came there. He saw Mary and Martha weeping. He saw his friend dead, and he did what any friend would do, cried. Uh, in fact, before he cried, he expressed human emotions. This is a verse that is sometimes overlooked. When he saw Mary crying over her brother's death, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. I took uh, the book of John from Dr. Merle Tenney, who was a former graduate professor at Wheaton College and a Greek scholar, and he said this can be translated... Uh, and he convulsed in his spirit. Did you ever have a wave of emotion? Uh, it happens to me usually at funerals. Uh, just you, you're there, you're doing fine, all of a sudden, whammo, you get hit with a wave. And you're trying to hold it back? That's what he's experiencing here. He, he uh, convulsed, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. That's verse 33. And then finally, he couldn't hold it back any longer, and two verses later, he cried. If that's not human... I don't know what's human. Jesus wept over Lazarus' death, his friend. He was angry with hypocrisy. Is it wrong to get angry? No, it's wrong to sin when you get angry. <laughs> it's, it's wrong to say something you shouldn't say or do something you shouldn't do. Uh, getting angry itself, if you don't get angry, you're not human. Uh, we should be angry at sin all the time. We should be angry at injustice. We should be angry at hypocrisy. Jesus particularly got angry at hypocrisy. He couldn't stand people who were uh, trying to pick a speck out of someone else's eye and they had a whole log jam in their own eye. He just he couldn't, he couldn't hack that. Uh, he said, woe unto you. Uh, Pharisees, scribes, you hypocrites, you whitewashed sepulchers, you dead men bones, and he reserved some of his strongest words for that. He wept over Jerusalem, crying, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Now this is near the end of his ministry, just before the cross. They've already rejected him. He's presented himself as king. They rejected the kingdom, and he's weeping. He came unto his own, his own received him not. He created, he was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. What an what a insult to the Creator and to their uh, Messiah, their Redeemer. And he wept over Jerusalem. 
He agonized in the garden, the sweat becoming like great drops of blood. We're told under extreme stress, uh, your uh, blood vessels can actually uh, break and give some blood, and it goes in, into, and you can actually sweat blood. Jesus was probably literally sweating blood from the stress that he was under. You think you've been under stress? Have you ever sweat blood? No, we have a metaphor uh, saying I sweat blood, but we didn't really sweat blood. He had vehement cries and tears. This is a little passage tucked away most people miss in Hebrews chapter 5. You don't expect it. A lot of emphasis on Jesus' humanity in Hebrews. It says he had vehement cries. He just cried out in agony to God when he was praying in the garden and on the way to the uh, cross. Vehement cries and tears. He felt forsaken by his father. You feel lonely, you feel forsaken. What if God was your father, you're the son of God, three times during your life, uh, in addition to all the miracles you're doing, he says from heaven, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased. You are my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then all of a sudden on the cross, he forsakes you. And there you are all alone on the cross. Everybody's forsaken. Eleven of your disciples are gone. Uh, a few, a handful around the cross. All your enemies there. And you say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's human. That's very, very uh, human. He had human emotions. He had a human death. Unlike the sons of Adam, he was not intrinsically mortal. In other words, he didn't inherit uh, depravity and natural death. He could be killed, but he would not have died a natural death. Uh, he was uh, mortal in the sense that he could be killed, but he was not mortal in the sense that he was fallible and inherited sin from Adam. He suffered before he died, 1 Peter 3.18. He was called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, Isaiah 53. He was also put to death in the flesh, tasted death for everyone, even felt forsaken in death. Now, many of the early heretics, and this is where this became a heresy, they said, well, he wasn't really human. That was God on the cross. He wasn't really human. He looked human, but he wasn't human. We'll find out the name of that uh, heresy in a little bit. This is clearly contrary to Scripture. Creedal statements. What did the early creeds say? Who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died. All of those are indications of his humanness. He was conceived, conceived of a human uh, being. Uh, he was born in the natural way. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, and he was crucified. By the way, um, most Catholics don't even know what they believe, and most Protestants don't know Catholics believe this, but Catholics believe that Mary was virgin before she conceived. She was virgin while she gave birth to him, and she was virgin after, never had any children. That's called the perpetual virginity of Mary. It's not taught in the Bible. Before she said, I rejoice in God my Savior, Luke 1, She was a sinner too. She was not immaculately conceived. But most Catholics believe that Mary did not have a natural birth. When Jesus was born, he was born miraculously, came right through the womb, the side of the womb. He was not born through the birth canal uh, that Mary never had. Uh, any ch children in the natural way, including Jesus, and that she was virgin after in that she never had any more children either. Not, not, none of those are taught in the Bible. The only part of that that's taught in the Bible is that he was virgin, she was a virgin when she conceived. Everything else was natural after that. The Nicene Creed says he was incarnate, that means in human flesh, and became truly human. Now notice, even by this time, they're adding uh, the word truly and human. Why? Because people are denying his humanity. The Chalcedonian Creed 451 says he was perfect, both in deity and in humanness. He was human, but perfect human. This selfsame one was born of the Virgin Mary, who is the God-bearer in respect of his humanness. Mary was the mother of God in the sense that the one she brought into the world was the God-man, but she was only uh, his mother in the sense of his human nature. She was the mother of, she was in the mother of his divine uh, nature. Uh, third, so what? What's the importance of Christ's humanity? 
Well, he must be human to redeem humans. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. Uh, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So we know this is a biblical teaching. Uh, Job said in chapter 9:33, I, I need a mediator. I need a daysman. Somebody who can lay his hand on God, lay his hand on me and bring us together. Of course, he said, I know my Redeemer liveth in Job 19, 25, and he will stand at the latter day upon the earth. He didn't have one there. Jesus was that mediator between God and man. Second, Jesus is the reconciler of God and man. Christ, uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world, world to himself. Now notice, God is never reconciled to the world. We're the ones that have to move. He didn't move. We moved away from God. He didn't move away from us. So we have to move back to God. We have to be reconciled to God. And Jesus uh, did that and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. But the catch is what? Jesus can't be a mediator and reconciler of both God and man unless he is both God and man. If he's not God, he can't reach to God. If he's not man, he can't reach to man. So the importance of his humanity is you couldn't be saved without it because he couldn't really redeem us if he wasn't one of us. But he was one of us. Adam is the first name listed on his genealogy, Luke 3. He had a real mother. He had a real grandfather and great-grandfather and all of the other things that we just talked about. But this is the picture that says it all for me. Why the God-man? In fact, there's a book written on this by St. Anselm, Cur Deus Homo, Why the God-Man, one of the great uh, books of all time, written by a Christian author around 1000 A.D. Cur Deus Homo, Why the God-Man? Because he's got to reach to both. So it has to be God, I colored blue for heavenly color. It has to be man, I colored brown for his human nature. Because only the God-Man can bridge between God and man. His humanness was just as important to our redemption as his divinity. He, of course, had to be God, but he also had to be man, and to diminish his humanity is as serious a heresy as to diminish his deity. Some unorthodox views. Apollinarianism, and we all said Apollinarianism. Uh, you say, I never heard of Apollinarius. Well, that's because you never heard of Apollinarius. Apollinarius was a 4th century heretic that said, uh, Jesus had a human body uh, and even a, a human soul, but he didn't have a human spirit. His spirit was replaced by the Holy Spirit. So he is, he's kind of like three-quarters human. So he diminished his humanity. He had a real human body. He was virgin born, a real... Uh, mother and all of that, but he didn't have a human spirit. Uh, instead of having his own human spirit, the Holy Spirit took the place of his human spirit. It's a heresy not because it denies his deity or his humanity. It diminishes his humanity and makes him not truly human. Docetism. This is a first century heresy. In fact, this one's mentioned in the Bible, 1 John 4. Docetism is a heresy that says, that denies his human nature, saying he's really God, but he only appears to be human. He's kind of uh, like uh, a phantasm or apparently human, but not really human. And then there's the heresy called Nestorianism from Nestorius, the 5th century, who divided his human person from his divine person, making two separate persons. You say, what does this do? That means there was a human person named Jesus who was born of Mary, who began in her womb at conception. Then there was a divine person, a second person, who existed from all eternity as the second member of the Trinity, say the bottom left corner of the triangle uh, from our illustration. And there are two persons. One person was divine and one person was human. And the one that suffered on the cross was the human person, not the divine person. Well, if the, if the human person is the only one that suffered, if he didn't suffer as the God-man, then he can't bring us to God and man. So again, it undermines our salvation. Why are these doctrines important? Because to deny any one of these doctrines undermines our salvation. We can't be saved if all of these 16 doctrines aren't true. 14, especially in the other two uh, from interpretation and the foundation in the Bible. 
It's a heresy to deny Christ's humanity. Here's where the heresy appears in the New Testament. 1 John. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. See, he's not talking about his deity. Those who confess his humanity has come in the flesh. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Probably the strongest way you can say something is a heresy in the New Testament. This stuff comes from the devil. The Antichrist. This is Antichrist doctrine to deny Christ's humanity. A very, very severe condemnation. Some objections. Objections of alleged contradiction. It's objected that it's contradictory to be both God and man at the same time. Now, how can you be God and be man at the same time? God is infinite, you're finite. God is not created, you're created, and so forth. God has no beginning, you do. Response, Jesus is both human and divine at the same time, but not in the same sense. So it is not contradictory. The law of non-contradiction, which you can't eat, you can't sleep, you can't stand up, you can't think, you can't do anything without the law of non-contradiction, that opposites can't both be true. You can't both have milk in the refrigerator and no milk in the refrigerator. You can't be here and not be here at the same time. That law says that you can't be two opposite things at the same time in the same sense. And he was not both divine and human in the same sense. He had two different natures. He was both divine and human at the same time, but not in the same uh, sense. Illustration, back to our illustration of the Trinity. The triangle represents God, who has three corners, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That existed forever. The circle started there on the left side of the triangle at conception. At conception, that human nature uh, was attached to the Son. Before that, he didn't have uh, human nature. He only had divine nature. He existed forever with God. He created the universe. Remember John 1, 2, and 3, and Colossians 1, 16, 17. At the moment of conception, Jesus also became human. Now, if I had a more dramatic way of putting this, I would start that little circle small at conception and make it grow because he grew up until it became mature and then became that, that size. Note, the divine nature is not the human nature. The triangle is not the circle. Jesus had both natures at the same time, but they're not the same nature. That same person had a divine nature. The triangle had a human nature of the circle, but they're not the same figures. Those are two different natures, but one person. Notice the circle is not on the top of the triangle because the Father doesn't have a human nature. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a human nature. Only the Son became human. Now, at Christmas time, and I hate to debunk some beautiful poetry, but it is poetry. At Christmas time, we say things that are technically not correct. We say, like, God became man. It's technically not correct. Uh, why? That's like saying the triangle became a circle. Can't happen. The infinite became a finite. Can't happen. The uncreated being became a created being. Forget about it. Uh, can't happen. What we should say is the second person of the Godhead, while retaining his position in the divine triangle, added another nature. In addition to his divine nature, he had a human nature. So more formally, we should say exactly what the Bible does say in John 1, 1 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Who is the Word? That's the second person. It didn't say God became flesh. It said the Word became flesh. Second person of the Trinity. Athanasius had the best way of saying this. In the incarnation, it was not the subtraction of deity, it was the addition of humanity. When Jesus became man, he didn't cease being God. Uh, he just became man in addition to being God. Then he was the God-man from that point on throughout all eternity. He had both natures at the same time, but they're not both the same natures. Another objection, that human nature is sinful. It's objected that human nature is sinful and Jesus was not sinful. Hence, he could not be human. 
response. Only fallen human nature is sinful, but human nature as such is not sinful. If human nature as such were sinful, then Adam was sinful before he fell. God created the perfect human nature, and before Adam fell, he had a perfect human nature, and it wasn't sinful. If human nature as such is sinful, then we'll be sinful in heaven, because we'll still be human. We won't become God. We're not pantheists. We don't say we're going to merge with God. We're still going to be humans in heaven, but we won't be sinful, because our sinful nature is taken away. Third stage of salvation, remember? Justification, sanctification, glorification. Justification, saving us from the penalty of sin. That's when you are born again. Sanctification, saving us from the power of sin all through our life. Glorification, saving us from the presence of sin. When we lose our sin nature, then we no longer have the propensity to sin and the necessity to die. When we get to heaven, we'll be perfect humans, sinless human beings, and we'll never be able to sin again. Oh, what a day that will be. Objection. To err is human and to love is divine. You uh, know that one? It's objected that to err is human and Jesus was human, so he must have erred. Let, let's face it. Nobody can live a perfect life for 33 and a half years. You know, but sooner or later, he's going to make a mistake. He's going to slip. He's going to uh, break one of the commandments. He's going to do something. To err is just human. So he, uh, if he's human, he must have erred. But he didn't err, the Bible says, therefore he can't be human. Response, the error is human, but does not follow logically. To be human is to err. See, all horses have four legs, but all four-legged things aren't horses. It's called the illicit conversion of a major term for you theologians here. You can't convert an A term. Uh, because uh, you can't reverse it. A lot of other four-legged things in the world, like uh, cows and chicken uh, and uh, dogs and cats and uh, not chickens, um, hopefully. But to err as human does not follow because to be human, uh, you can be human without erring. Uh, so what? I think the most important so what to me of Christ's humanness is this. Hebrews 4.15, uh, translated by Phillips. In the Phillips translation, remember, uh, he did the New Testament. He's going to do the Old Testament. Now they're going to call it Phillips 66. <laughs> Bad joke. Uh, got that from one of my students. Uh, Phillips translated the New Testament. It's kind of a paraphrase. It's a really good translation for if you like paraphrases. He said in Hebrews 4.15, we have no superhuman high priest to whom our infirmities are unintelligible. Beautiful, beautiful translation of he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet apart from sin. We have no superhuman high priest to whom our infirmities are unintelligible. Why? He had them too. He had anxiety. He had suffered. He had anguish. He had a friend who died. He cried. Uh, and uh, he probably cried with a greater depth than any of us could cry because he saw greater implications to it than we did. He was completely human. So we don't have any God who is far off. Can never, you can never blame the Christian God for being remote for two reasons. One, he's imminent, not just transcendent. He's not only out there, he's in here holding the whole world up. By him all things are held together, Colossians 1. And he upholds the whole world by the word of his power. So you can't blame God for being up there but not in here. He's here He's here spiritually. He's here imminently. And secondly, the second person of the Godhead became a man and experienced every single thing that we do, including the lure to sin. He experienced uh, hunger and thirst and anxiety and frustration and loneliness. So when you go to him, you've got a sympathetic ear. When you go to Jesus, you don't have somebody that doesn't understand. He understands, uh, and he can comfort us. I remember I started pastoring in 1954, and we just went back to visit our, uh, our home church last summer. Now, I didn't do the math. I should have known this, but it was a shocker. But you know what my youth group is doing? They're either dead or celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. 
because I married them in 55, 56, 57. I married them, so they're all celebrating their 50th. You know you're getting old when? Your youth group is celebrating their 50th anniversary. <laughs> uh, but the, the point of the story is that God knows our situation better than we do. And when I was a 22-year-old, which I was, 22-year-old pastor uh, back then, you don't have to do the math, I'll be 75 this summer. Uh, the, when I was a 22-year-old pastor going on 23, I used to, somebody would die and I'd say, you know, I'd put my arm on and say, I understand. I didn't understand. I never had a cat die. I, ne I never had a dog die. I mean, how did I understand, let alone a brother, a sister, a mother, father, loved one? You don't really understand. So I... I learned soon that you don't say, I understand, if you don't understand. You find somebody that does understand uh, to talk to them. You can pray for them. You can sympathize with them. You can love them. You can read scripture to them. But don't say, I understand, because you don't. But Jesus does. He understands. Isn't it neat to have a God who was man, human, just as human as we are, experienced everything we did? That's why when we get to another fundamental doctrine, he ascended into heaven and he is a priest at God's right hand. This is why we can be comforted to know that this is a priest who was one of us and who went through everything we did and can comfort us in all.